Good morning, everyone. It's an honor for me to be here. I want to thank Moodle for selecting me through this conversation. So let me just put my timer because I know I'm going to go over it. So just so you know that I did have an intention. So I have prepared a, a reflection with you along with a few words in Spanish that you need to learn. So I'm very happy that this event is happening in my country. I am from Mexico City, although I work in uh, many countries in Latin America. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to act as a reflection, but also as a vocabulary learning. So you need to find along the day today a Mexican, and you need to have a conversation about some specific words. So given that the party was so good last night, English has beautiful words, but I'm sure they don't have a word like pachanga. So you need to find out what pachanga, you already found out yesterday, but you just don't know the meaning. So you need to survive pachanga. So I'm going to give you a few words. Please write it down. Find a Mexican and talk about pachanga and how was your pachanga last night, because I felt it was very good. All right. So I had put a number of years to put Latin America in the innovation education map and the world into Latin America. And this was the beginning of a reflection that started many, many years ago when I realized that education was not going to be able to transform from within. That all of the industries are being transformed by entrepreneurs. So very early, 2009, before there was an edtech industry, nobody spoke about edtech, I began to look at where are these teachers that are not satisfied with where education is going. And I coined this term edupreneurs because I realized that education had a problem, that people that understand pedagogy was very difficult for them to understand technology. People that come from technology had a lot of difficulty connecting technology for people and for learning. But both elements were incomplete unless you think capital, money, investment, resources, spaces. And then the fourth element, we are the generation with a unique responsibility in humanity. We are the first generation that is able to transform education for millions of young children, adults, and youth. So this is our responsibility. So again, I started and there was no ed tech industry, there was no investment. I did probably the first six acquisitions of ed tech between 2009 and 2015. In 2017, I realized that this was going to become an industry. In 2021, we thought this was going to change everything. Billions of dollars, 21 billions of dollars came into the ed tech market and then the pandemic ended and we were back to where we started. Now, my question is, you think we're back to where we started in 2019? It's totally different. So I am going around the world. I work with people, with venture capital, with ed techs, with universities, with schools around the world. When we started, this LinkedIn premise was that you were six degrees of separation between anyone. I can assure you that today and in education, you are two degrees of separation between anything that you want to do. So we need to do that. And that's how I began building this at, at LATAM Alliance, which is the largest Latin American network of leaders. We have over 2,000 people that are collaborating, thinking. And this is why I believe it's relevant for you to do this event in Latin America, because Moodle has an opportunity in Latin America probably in Africa, probably in some of these emerging markets. But the problems that we're facing are different than in emerging markets. So it's not a matter of doing a whole transformation. It's a matter of doing small things better, much better every single day. So how do we do this? And this is a statement that says, we used to think that learning was a straight line. Not anymore. Learning is not a straight line, as life is not a straight line anymore. So we need to change. We need to think that the evolution, the stations, you know, humanity, the structure in the organizations, they used to be pretty linear. We are away from the linear thoughts anymore. Right now, 
People are going to work in spaces that we don't even imagine. This is a reality. People are working anywhere, and the expectations from the young population are totally different. Now, many people are designing new offices for the future, and we are stuck in the past in many, many different categories. We are still educating for the industrial era where jobs were going to last forever. And we are creating a generation that is not able to read and understand what they're reading and is not able to manage emotions. What sort of humanity are we going to build right now? And this is how we work with education. We work with institutions, with leaders, with technologies. We need to build a better human race, and we have an opportunity. So how do we do that? I started you know, with this type of reflection. This is when I was born, 1965, how you met you know, your, your partner for life. It was through friends, through family, through co-workers. But now couples meet online. And now everybody wants to have a dog or a cat, but nobody wants to have kids. What's going to happen? What's going to happen with this type of generation? You know, we're going to have robots as, as son and daughters. This is changing radically. So also what is changing is our thought of what intelligence used to be. Intelligence used to be linked to time spent learning and a grade or a degree. That is not true anymore. Intelligence is much more than that. Another word for your reflection. Find a Mexican and look words like atarantado. This is how most of you f f <laughs> feel right now after a party. So you know what a pachanga is and how atarantado you're going to be. <laughs> for that. So you're going to learn a few vocabulary words around my presentation. So anyways, in order for you to not, not be atarantado, you're going to have to move from knowing it all to learning it all. It's totally different when you learn all. So what is the first thing that you need to do when you're helping institutions, when your, te your technology is helping? We need to help them move from only cognitive learning to cognitive, social, and emotional. Every single experience needs to be cognitive, social, and emotional. Otherwise, there is no learning. So what happened? This is PISA, the results that you all know. And we used to think that Singapore was the best country because they had the best academic results and cognitive performance. But then, then their kids were suicidal when they were trying to get into a university. And then they began to find out that it required a difficult balance between learning things, relating with others, being able to be resilient, being able to be emotional, connect with their teachers. And then this happened. The cognitive knowledge is now mandatory. Anybody has access to knowledge. There is an abundance. So if there is an abundance of knowledge, where do we need to focus? We need to focus in the human traits. We need to focus in empathy. We need to focus in making better humans. So this is the map. We need to build emotions. We need to make sure that every single learning has to have an emotional path. And the emotional path begins with designing environments that are on the happy side, on the yellow side, on the colorful parties. Not in the blue side that are boring, rigorous, and this is how you learn. You know, you go back to 19th century so you can be ready for the 21st century. We need to design everything to be enthusiastic, happy, and enjoyful. So what happens next is that we used to think that education was a period in your life. I sent a report to UNESCO. I presented that in Barcelona 2022. And I said, please, let's get rid of the concept of graduation. Graduation used to mean that you ended your learning path and you were ready to work. You're never ready to work and you're never ending your learning path. So let's eradicate a graduation. A graduation is only a step in the journey. So I believe that you can only graduate as a teacher when your, student, when your students fall in love of learning forever. That's the graduation. If your student is in love of learning forever, then you can say, go on. You're going to be successful. 
So then what happens is today we're seeing that AI is creating an amazing gap now. There's people that have never used AI today and the gap is growing every single week and we're creating this new, what I call augmented intelligence, which is our cognitive, emotional and social complemented by technology. And there's people doing studies that I found amazing that people with dyslexia have now an opportunity. Dyslexia used to be one of the ma major failures with the traditional system. If you had dyslexia, it was very difficult for you to succeed. Suddenly, people with dyslexia have reasoning, communication, visualizing, connecting, and communication skills that are needed for this type of intelligence. So this is what happened. And, and I went back to history and said, when was humanity in charge of something like this. And I found the amazing story, I recommend the book of the inventor of nature, where they go through the life of Alexander von Humboldt, who was a scientist, who was a scholar, who was you know, an environmental. But basically, what is meaningful about the story of Alexander von Humboldt and that generation is that Alexander von Humboldt's friends were the philosophers. Get Schiller. So now, the engineers need to work with the philosophers. Now the anthropologists need to help the sociologists and the technologists. That had never happened before. I had friends and sons, friends of my son that wanted to study philosophy and people would say, why, how are you gonna live? Well, now we have an opportunity to connect sciences, humanities again. And this is the new generation, this is our call. We have to relate with technology and with the environment, with nature in a way that no other generation had before. And my proposal is that we do this by designing new futures. Futures in plural. Every single academic course should have the student as a protagonist of the future and should be able to imagine what future they're going to build. That should be part of every single course from now on. We've, we've mapped with artificial intelligence the same prompt during a period of 12 months, how it was improving, but also how it has these biases. If you ask for a nurse, typically you would find a woman and typically you used to see Images built by computers. Today, you don't know if that image is a real person or not. And this only happened in a few weeks. So now we are like Galileo in the sense of we are trying to judge the findings of this new technology and we're trying to figure out if that is going to be positive or not for humanity. And many people think that artificial intelligence is here for us to do less work, to go into the escalator, the electric escalator, and just copy and paste, and just have a co-pilot. It's totally wrong. Artificial intelligence is for us to do more effort, more human, more creative, more imagination. And that's why we need to go through the other stairs. So most people say, yeah, I used to take five hours, now it takes five minutes, I sit on the escalator. No, you need to think again and again and be more creative, more human. Now that needs the creation, and we brought this from the financial industry. We need the creation of portfolio of assets of learning. Assets of learning may appreciate or depreciate, just as the financial assets. So what are the assets of learning that you're building today and how are you going to keep them appreciated for the rest of your life? And if they're going to depreciate, what is your plan for the next portfolio of learning? Now we're moving away from digital certifications to digital certifications of learning assets with a time period. Because this is like yogurt is going to be expired pretty soon. Now, we have something to do. And in Mexico, we call this chamba. Find out what the chamba is going to be because it's going to be totally different. 
Now, welcome to the future. Welcome to a time where we need to say goodbye to the school as we know it. We need to say goodbye to the Disney characters and animation as we know it, the production as we knew it. And now, something happened in November 2022. A guy that nobody knew put a Twitter and said, I'm gonna create a new tool here, a new game. I, I am trying to tweet every day to see if I have the same results, but it hasn't happened yet. But the guy, just after that tweet, got one million users in five days, 100 in two months. This is, this is the technology that is going to touch more people faster than anything else. It's bringing billions of dollars of investment. It's creating hardware that we don't know how it's going to work, but in a few weeks, you're gonna get pieces of hardware that are not 25 or 50% better, are 500% better. So now what are we gonna do when all of these companies have all the research, resources, money, technology to build something different? What happens with these guys that have, you know, the Nobel Prize for machine learning, but we still have a pending account? How many women are winning the Nobel Prizes? These are pending accounts from our generation. We cannot have the, you know, physics Nobel Prizes at 200 and only two women. What do we need to do? So we're building with universities programs and projects where always women are leading so men can learn to have a woman as their boss. We don't know. It has never happened. So in my career, I had like about 30 bosses, two women. My son has had four bosses, three women. This is the time that we need more women in these sciences. So what are we gonna do? We are the generation with a big responsibility. We cannot do education as we used to only a few months ago. The things I'm gonna tell you were not possible a year ago. This is what we're doing with McKinsey. We're finding this, what we call the hybrid intelligence. We're finding all the people that are dedicated to art that now are complemented with technology, with robots. So we're finding painters, we're finding dancers, we're finding people complemented by technology in ways that we have never seen before. In Japan, where you have the most active, older population doing physical work, this is how they're using technology to make sure that the older population remain active physically as much as they can. But have you ever thought about building the multi-generational university? Why is it that we think that university should have only students that are between 18 and 24 years old? Who is teaching the 18 years old to collaborate with the 15 years old, with the 58 years old? In business, in the, in the industry, we're having seven different generations at once. We're having people that are not going to retire until they are 99, and I'm gonna to have to be working with people that are 30. How do we design for the multi-generational university? And in, in artificial intelligence is not a bucket. It's going to come in entertainment, in sports, in video games, in everything, in health, it's everywhere. And it's moving fast, but not fast in education. So we have, you know, we pay $20 a month to get Disney, to get Netflix, but we don't pay $20 a month to get ChatGPT or Gemini or Anthony. We, we think that that should come for free. But if we are not experimenting today, we're missing on what is happening. So just a few days ago, we had the first autonomous cars being announced, the first robots that are going to have humanoid perspectives are going to join. This is the world that we are preparing our students for. So what are we doing? We are still thinking that this is subject-based, faculty-based, so sciences and and humanities do not talk to each other. For artificial intelligence, connecting music with biology is very easy. 
for us is very painful because we think science, biology, and music are totally different fields. So we need to connect, we need to build multidisciplinary approaches. We also need to use artificial intelligence in layers. You have to have your own trained artificial intelligence for what you do. You need to have your artificial intelligence layer for your faculty, for your class, for your university, and then open for the world. But all of them, they need to be connected. You cannot have a space where only your artificial intelligence exists without connecting with what the world is advancing. So we need to have these layers. I have my own artificial intelligence. I have my company's artificial intelligence. I have the world's artificial intelligence. So then we were very impressed with what happened with the first version. And then the next version was totally better. Then the next version allowed for us to create apps and things amazing. It was amazing. Now it's even better. This is growing exponentially. And we still think that this is linear. We don't know that the next one is going to be much better. We don't know that the next one is going to be just very, very impressive. I was in New York a couple of weeks ago in a quantum computing seminar. I didn't understand like probably 90% of what they were talking about. But what was very funny is that I thought, this was my thought after living one day in, in NYU. These guys are working with, for us, what would be ChatGPT version 15. We are seeing version four. And the only reason what we're not seeing ChatGPT version 15 is because we're not ready. We don't have the capabilities to think about what is going to happen. So the way we approach this with universities is that we put artificial intelligence as a table of very knowledgeable experts. And we create conversations that go horizontally and vertically. And then we arrive to the faculty, to the department. So we created a number of tools to help universities curate, understand, and deal with artificial intelligence. This is a platform that knows when to use artificial intelligence, for what, and at what cost, because now you need to pay for tokens. And depending on the interaction that you have with artificial intelligence, you have more expensive tokens or cheaper tokens or even free tokens. But you need to know that. How do we expect the normal person to know? And everybody says, yeah, artificial intelligence is very easy. You don't need to be technical. Yeah, but you need to be sensible. And the only way is to be open to everything that is happening. Because now intelligence from artificial in intelligence is much higher than our average IQ. And the projections that used to think about when is the future of artificial intelligence going to surpass every single cognitive knowledge it used to be 2050, then 2030. Every time we get a new tool, the projection is coming earlier, earlier. We're sitting today at 2027. In 2027, our students are going to have tools that you cannot even imagine. So what do we do? What do we do in a world that you're going to have artificial intelligences all around you for deep knowledge, for horizontal knowledge? So this is a Mexican expression, a sumecha. So write this down, find with the Mexican what a sumecha means. But this is what is happening, a sumecha. This is how the programmers in the US are being reduced because of the capabilities from artificial intelligence. I went on and I tried to do something with ChatGPT's new apps, the new GPTs. I said, if I am a restaurant owner, how many agents would I have at my disposal for free? I found 400 for a restaurant owner. 400. So I tried to do this just for you to imagine that every single role in every single country and every single level is going to have agents already working. I don't know if you saw the announcement just a couple of days ago from, from Anthology that now they can operate your computer and your apps from AI. So this is what we need to do. We need to think about education, but we need to accelerate. We need 
to do everything that is meaningful for this future, not for the past. But we also need to rescue the best from the past. And that is not an easy task. Because our students are going to be playing different games, are going to be exposed to different advertising. They're going to be even figuring out how a computer can eat a, a Big Mac. They're going to listen to music that is created by artificial intelligence. And this is very worrisome. They're going to have personal conversations, intimate conversations. A couple of days ago, there is a discussion that you can look for. A kid, 14 years old, that took his own life. And the only person that this kid spoke to was a chat, a chatbot. And in reading the conversations of the chatbot, they found out how disturbed this person was. Now there is a, a legal discussion about the responsibility of the chatbot in the life of this kid. We've never faced this type of challenges before. And now what happened is the computer does not need a mouse, a keyboard anymore. They need to have conversations like we do. They are learning our language. We used to have to learn the language. We used to think that talking to a computer was through a keyboard and through text. Not anymore. So this is our proposal. Our proposal is everyone, you, you and me, we need to look at what task we're doing that should be done by a machine. But for what reason? To elevate our humanity, to become better humans, complemented by technology, but not to become robots ourselves. That is the challenge. So how do we do that? Because now there was this task that humans could do now that some of these tasks can be automated. This is the, ele the electric escalator. But now we have to figure out what are the human activities that we need to do better because we have all of this power. So with Singularity University, we started working on this type of design methodology. Let's build courses that at the same time work with mindset, skill set, and tool sets. Because we used to build courses for skills. But now we need skills, mindsets that are exponential, and tools that are coming to complement us. Everything should be mindset, skill set, tool set. And this is then how we began doing. This is a model that we created. We're, we're trying this with eight universities today, where active learning is at the center of any learning. The student become, becomes a protagonist of the future. Every course has future design, emotional design, collaborative, playful design, but not to collaborate with the same, collaborate with the different. So we're using a methodology, and I recommend this other book, called Collaborating with the Enemy, from Adam, Adam Kahane. Learn to collaborate with people that think differently because now we're living in the most polarized era of the world and we need to learn how to make things happen even with people we don't trust. So now it's not about learning to use technology in the classroom, it's learning to succeed in the digital era. And we could not do that a few months ago. So the way we do it is that we break every single course into small tasks that we try to augment. So the teacher used to be a good teacher for some students in some activities. Now we're building agents to make sure that every teacher is a good teacher for every student. Some students were better at receiving or learning. We're trying to make agents that make every student better, every activity better. And then what happens is that the return on education becomes multidimensional. You don't only have a return on learning, but you have a, a return on time, you have return on information, you have return on trust, on impact. So the returns are totally different. We even went back and licensed and bought this technology, the, the HoloLens. So we're bringing holograms to classes. And sometimes the holograms are a person that is teaching at home. Sometimes it's a digital avatar that is reaching communities very far away that only need a little bit of connectivity for a little bit of time and they can get classes that they never gotten before. Everything like that I'm telling you is happening today. Everything that I'm telling you 
is building what Holon IQ built as a framework of higher education a few years ago. So what we're doing today is that we're breaking, sorry, we're breaking every single process of a university into small buckets, into tasks, and we're saying, is this task better performed by a human or by a human with a computer or only by the computer? That is a discussion. Because if you have an activity that is better performed by a computer, let's leave it. And if you have an activity that is better for you and the computer together, let's do that. And you need to focus into the activities that only humans can do. Very difficult, but this is the real path. We're building these platforms. We created an agent that works with teachers and with students to help you explain, help you design, help you evaluate, help you get feedback. This is not to give you answers. This is to help you learn better. better. We have over 9,000 students today learning with this body that they, we created. We have over 900 teachers learning with this body. So what is going to happen? Our students are going to go to a concert and then they're gonna come back and see a different technology and they're gonna feel lost in the 19th century. Or they're gonna go shopping and they're gonna get excited about what is going on. They're gonna come back to class and they're gonna feel in the 19th century. They're gonna start creating art that is a little bit of a blend between the digital world and the physical world. You're gonna begin seeing creativity like you've never seen before. You're going to begin to be exposed to different types of imagination, creativity, where science, humanities, art, music, business are all going to blend. You cannot have a faculty of business separated from a faculty of music, from a faculty of science, from a faculty of philosophy. Now we're seeing the first Museum of Art with Artificial Intelligence. Nothing that I'm telling you is science fiction. This is a database of signals of the future that we curate every single day to see what is going to happen. Then we work with universities. Then we try to help them. During the pandemic, I was very frustrated to see that everybody talked about how our students didn't have access to digital learning. And then I made a study to figure out how many of these very same students were doing social media. And I found that only 5% of learning was happening with social media, 5%. Then I went to the apps, to the app stores, I spoke with Apple, I spoke with Android, and I found out that all of the apps that had their very same students were only using 15% for learning. We're losing the game. If we were only tied in these statistics, our learning would be totally different. So, another word, está cañón. You have to learn these words to Spanish to understand what is going on in this world. So we went on to say then, if this is happening, what can we learn from the gaming industry? Why, what can we learn from this industry that is growing and growing and growing? What if Roblox was a school? Well, if Roblox was a school, they would have 218 million or 210 million students. Roblox. What if League of Legends was a subject? they would be studying this subject for 618 million hours. Why is it that we are not learning for 210 stu million students, 600 million hours? Because we need to do different designs. So I went and I spoke with these platforms and I said, why are you bringing concerts to these video game platforms? What is happening? Why is it that in most of the education events, I go to probably 35 events a year, and I find these e-sports aisles in education. Why is it that all universities are now thinking about e-sports teams? Why is it that the movies today are now featuring characters from video games. What is happening that we're not seeing in education? What are these tools that we could take? 
What is it that now the most recognized game, soccer, football, now has a challenger? And, and when FIFA began seeing this, they said, no, this is not serious until they got more millions of fans than they have. Now they're taking it serious because this is designed for the new generation. And then I said, okay, let me work. We work with 30, 30 companies. And I sat with the product designers. And you know, I found a few methodologies that education should have. These product designers do a thing that is very simple, the engagement loop. There is no learning if there is no emotion first. First emotion, then action, then feedback. Emotion, action, feedback. That's good. But then they design, and those post-its are real post-its from the product designers that are designing emotions that are both positive and negative. So I'm gonna create a little bit of anxiety here. So you feel the anxiety and you're willing to learn. We, in education, we only tend to think about the good emotions and the good and the safe and everything is protected and then our children go out and everything is unprotected and they don't, need, they don't know what to do. The other thing, we all have an aunt or an uncle that is a gamer, right? I do. When my uncle loses in a video game, he goes, ah, I'm gonna try it again. When we lose in education, we say, I'm not good at math. And when my uncle wins in education, what's next? What's the next level? Who am I going to compete now? When we succeed in education, I already have an A. Why would I want an A plus? That's too much. So the other thing is that they teach us a lot of possibilities. They have us ready for th something unexpected that is going to happen. In education, we try to be agile, but in order for us to be agile, we need to lose control. We need to move away from the right answer. We need to move away from the same exam, the same day with the same question for the same students. And now what we call cheating in education, in games they find, let's find out who knows the answer and let's learn from that person. Let's go and get the ability that I don't have. Let me find someone that is a ninja and has that ability. And now this is going to come to our lenses. This is going to come to our lives and computers are moving away from the screens and are interacting with our typical applications and we are not doing it in education. This is also not science fiction. You can look at this UK school that has a headmaster that is now a robot with AI and the teachers are more happy. The teachers are happier. <laughs> and you're getting these models of people that are coming up and saying, you know what, I'm gonna build this new university, this new high school only with AI. That is wrong. This is not for us to become robots or to have teachers replaced. We need to have teachers that have more human skills. But this is moving very fast. So you have a new word, a new phrase to learn. Ya nos cargó el payaso. Which in Spanish means, I, you, you, you're supposed to find out what it means. We're getting into the red zone now of the words that we need to learn. In Japan also, we found this amazing technology that is using robots to get people with disabilities to become active and to really provide value to the community. So this is the good way of humanizing technology. There are a lot of good ways to humanize technology. Let me give you a philosophical question. Have you ever thought why city is called city and not city? It's philosophical. Why Alexa is Alexa and not Alexis? Well, these guys are using neuroscience and cognitive science and addictive sciences to know that it's better for a human to relate with a technology with a female voice than with any other voice. So we're not using cognitive science, neuroscience in a way that we create addiction of learning. We're losing it. So now we see in Finland that there's a lot of people that are working on teaching students how to make sure that this is the right information, how to recognize misinformation, but not to block it, to recognize it, to fight it, to think about it. 
I'm sure you saw just a few weeks ago about these kids from Harvard that put these glasses on and went to the streets and they had these glasses connected to Facebook and they could go to a, to a woman and say, I know you, you were here last week, you have two daughters and they, were, they are studying in NYU. How do you know? I, I've never seen you in my life. Well, my glasses tell me a lot about you. So this is the world that we are preparing our students. We're seeing a technology that used to track the vision of the students to see if they were looking on online to see if they were doing the exams. Two weeks after that, they created this technology to move their eyes so you don't know what they're looking at. We are still trying to beat the technology. We don't know if these guys are really friends or this is imaginary. We're looking for signals that are now decoding the conversation from animals and they are succeeding in understanding how animals communicate through AI and they are being able to influence animal behavior because they understand this. So we, this is the world that we're educating for. And the only way to regulate this is for us to build smarter AI connected to the big AI, but in a way that is meaningful for education. That is our choice. It's not something that is going to come from the accreditation, from the regulation. It's going to come from the education business being able to build better experiences and regulate the big guys so they don't create a mess in education. So the more, the more compelling the problems that we're faced, the more that we need to collaborate. And this is why I admire Moodle, their founders, their management, because this is how you solve problems, with a community, diverse community, with diverse approaches. It's not one way will help us all. So the more challenges that we have, the biggest community, the more diverse community we need to solve them. This is what is happening in probably one of the most cognitive industries, which is consulting. They put teams with consultants and AI working side by side with teams with consulting without AI. The guys that had AI were 12% more productive, more tasks, but they were also 25% faster and also 40% better. Why? because they connected to knowledge that was not necessarily in, at the hands of the team that did not have artificial intelligence. So, I have another phrase for you. It says, no que no tronabas, pistolita? You have to find out what that means. You have a few words now that you're gonna have a lot of conversation with Mexicans, I hope. So, what is our only choice? Our only choice today is design for a better human race. Design for someone that is going to compete against robots, but is going to win with humanity. Design for better stories we need to become better storytellers, more conversational, more questioning, more insights, more diverse stories that we can do better than the computers. We need to provide environments for humans to thrive, for all students to be happy, for all students to succeed, and not only the ones that get good grades, that we think are intelligent. Why do you think the most popular classes in Harvard and Yale are the happiness courses? Because we have created a generation that lacks purpose. That is not a success. We need to create a generation that has purpose. Why do you think the media now is launching these new products of helping us ask better questions. And I'm gonna tell you a story about this sign that we found in Copenhagen in Denmark a few years ago. This is called the Human Library. But the Human Library does not rent books. They rent people for difficult conversations. 
and their marketing is less, let's unjudge someone. So what you do, you arrive into this library, make sure you go in summer, not in winter. You arrive to this library and I said, you know what? My daughter has anorexia. I don't know what to do. I'm losing her. This lady rented a woman with anorexia and went out to the park for two hours to empathize with someone so she could better accompany her daughter. This is things that make us more human. This is the potential of what we need to build. Recently, the New York Times began launching this type of media to ask ethical questions. Why? Because this is the abilities that we're gonna need in the future. Ask the difficult questions. So when I was in, at UNESCO Future of Higher Education Seminar in, in Barcelona in 2022, and this is part of the, the reason why I got this vision of Visionary of the Year Award, was because I, I put together this map that resembles the subway of, of London. I said, you're gonna enter learning in the station that is closer to you. And then you're gonna move to your next destiny. Sometimes your next destiny is the red line from point to point. Many times your next destiny is three lines or three stations in the red, two in the green, but you're gonna come back in a week, you're gonna come back later today. You're never going to end up your learning journey. You're always going to be moving to your next destination. Hopefully this has been a good session I'll give you a couple of words for you to understand with the Mexicans. It's time for me to ahuecar el ala. I'm getting ready to the end. I hope you found a good, a good session. And here's my information to keep the conversation. I'm gonna be in the breaks all day today. And uh, I think I even have time for a few questions. And thank you, I hope this was a good reflection. Thank you so much. Oh, are we on? Hello. Thank you so much for that, Fernando. Uh, amazing, inspiring, yeah. thought provoking. Thank you. Uh, we do, you've rattled through that actually. So we've got about eight or nine minutes. Any, well, actually, we've got to do a couple of things. So we'll go seven minutes of questions. Who would like to ask a question? You can also ask about vocabulary in Mexican <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> oh, it was just there from there. <laughs> Hola, muchas gracias. De verdad, qué inspirador. I'll, I'll say it in English. Um, you slightly mentioned the Singularity University, and I wonder, uh, what is the learning model behind it? Because you slightly slip it. Could you just talk a little bit about it? Because I think that that might elaborate more on what you were presenting. Which one, I'm sorry, did not get, can you, can you repeat? Singularity University. Uh, singularity. singularity, no. Yeah. With Singularity, what we did is this model that it's actually coming from the future of work. So what we said is the future of work basically is going to need these three type of experiences built in the same one. So the mindset, skill set, tool set is the way they design for a mindset that is exponential, for skills that allow you to know what to do with technology, what to do more humanistically, and then the tools that allow you to do that. So basically, what they find in the future of work is these three things coming together, mindset, skill set, tool set. Was that the one that you were asking? Yeah, and is that break, uh, broken down into micro learnings or? Yeah, so that is basically every single course and every single activity has a dimension of what type of mindset you need, what type of skills are gonna be able to, so that's why it connects with this Lego piece that I built in the beginning, which is these uh, five elements that you have an augmented teacher with an augmented learner in an augmented activity. 
That activity has these three dimensions. So this is how we're kind of breaking all of these problems into every learning asset. And we're building this micro-credential that does not give you a certificate at the end, but it gives you an asset of learning certificate and says, this has probably an appreciation path if you do this or a depreciation path if you. So it's all connected in that type of reasoning. Gracias. We had one more just, just there and then maybe come through. Oh, go on. Good morning, Fernando. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Matabu Nakenim I'm the Vice Principal for Technology from the University of South Africa. The Ed Latam Alliance, do you see more um, groupings or um, formations like that across continents, or is this something that you've only observed in, in this continent? No, this is actually a node in a very big set of networks in, in education. And I was told I needed to talk to you because your presentation was very good, so I'm glad. But anyway, uh, we are part of a global network of different types of collective learning. So we have an association that is connected with the NGOs that are working. We have the Global EdTech Startup Award Network that has over 20 countries collectively looking at the ethics. So there's different, so there's things, again, I think the key is that we, we put ourselves in the center of pedagogy, technology, capital, and impact. Each one of those has a big network. So if you look at capital, for example, we're working with the impact investment community, and we have many people, probably about 3,000 people now, and actually every February here in Merida is the largest gathering in the world of impact investors. So what we do is, if we need to connect impact investment with pedagogy, how do you do that? Well, with this network of people, so learning more from people than from books, learning more from people. So we connect to these networks, so the Ed Latam Alliance basically moves away in capital, pedagogy, technology, and impact. Hi, um, I'm Fred Dixon, and I'm with the Big Blue Button Project. You said something about esports, which I always find fascinating. I play games lots in the earlier life. Esports has an element where you are rewarded through the journey of doing sports, and you are celebrated by your peers as you do it. So people look at you as, hey, you've succeeded. But learning is sometimes an individual operation, right? Education system is we teach people individual. So you don't get that reward along the journey, and you don't get that celebration from your peers like, hey, you learned something, good job. So how do we, what would the education system look like if it could look more like esports, where it's less individual and it's more celebrated by peers? I think the key is that the system is specifically a set of different capabilities. So not everything is to look like esports. Not everything is to be individual. Not everything is to be collective. So the idea, and that's why we are breaking this. When you think about this mentality of the agents, when I looked at how we're breaking a university into small pieces, some of these pieces are perfect for that. Some others are not. Some others are individual, a person in a classroom learning. Some are not. So the idea is you have an arsenal of different design tools but you need to design what's best for your students. And you need to move away from the average student and everything is gamified or any or nothing is gamified. So we think there is one system that serves all of the students, but we're forgetting that any system is failing some students at the top, some students at the bottom, and today, and this is not something that I could have said a year ago, today we can make sure that every activity fits to the students at every level, to the teachers at every level, and we should all aim to have the best teacher with the best activity for the best student. And if that is taken from eSports, that is a weapon in our disposal, but not to be used for every single action in the system. So I think it's a, it's a balance, and it's always a design challenge. Thank you. Okay, we'll do a final question. Privilege of the founder. Hey, Fernando. Uh, Martin, the founder of Moodle. I, I, I think I heard your name before. I don't know where. Uh, 
Um, I'm, I'm really interested in, in your experience uh, with uh, higher education, particularly, I guess, but any education in uh, Mexico and LATAM. Uh, how do you, do you, any reflections on how it's different or similar to higher education or education in other parts of the world? Like, yeah, I, more specific. I, yeah. To me, it's very difficult to say, you know, there's packets of very innovative universities all over the world. Now, let me give, answer you with, with this uh, story. Something that we built with Duke University only a few months ago in May. We created the network of startup universities. Universities that have 20 years or less, we put together 40 of these universities. I created one university brand new a year ago in Mexico that has a lot of the elements of this startup university mentality. But what we found out is that these startup universities are agile, flexible, they don't care about accreditation and rankings as the more traditional as do, and that allows them to be faster, but they also need some of the traditional. So my answer would be, you would find universities in every country that are doing very innovative pieces, but we have the same difficulties in Japan, in Singapore, in Finland. And that's why I think education should not have a boundary. It's, it's not about anything local. I think the worst thing that happens is that we think that public education is good, private education is bad, we all have good and bad everywhere. We all have traditional universities that are trying to evolve and other universities that say it's easier to build something from new, from scratch, than trying to move these animals that are very big and very difficult. So I think it's a period of experimentation, but also it's a period of sharing. So my main concern in Mexico, in Colombia, in Brazil, I, I, have, I am part of the board, for example, of the Federation of Universities in Brazil. We have 400 universities. And the problem is that these universities only talk to universities that look alike. And that's what we need to break. We need to talk to the different. We need to be able to be bigger audiences. Well, 77% of them use Moodle, so we can be maybe be a bridge. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, we're going to wrap that. Thank you ever so much, Fernando.